yeah, we just wanted to tape trade too. And that was, um, what is the easiest way to get on tapes? You form your own band, you know, so you have something to trade with, you know, so, mm. uh, and that was like the reason why we actually, um, or why, why I formed my first band Morgoth in, let's say 87, you know. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm Adam and this is about you and your journey in music. All right. Yes. Cool. Um, first off, I, I did read originally from Germany. Is that where you're still based? Yes. Uh, Berlin, Germany. Yes, that's that's correct. Were you born in Berlin? Um, no, I'm actually not born in Berlin. It's um, I was born in, a, in the industrial area of Germany, an area called Dortmund. Okay. Uh, where there was like a the thrash movement from the 80s, like create bands like Creator and Sodom, they come from that area. So I was born into that kind of <laughs> uh, thrash uh, area surrounding kind of cities, you know. Oh, that's awesome. Was that, uh, that's, um, were you, I mean, yeah, growing up with that music, was that something that you have always been uh, into uh, or kind of involved in? And, or prior to that, were you do, playing in different bands? Um, well, I mean, I discovered that that or the rock music always like um, w was something that was around in my life because my mm -hmm. father was listening to whatever uh, Led Zeppelin stuff like that and sure. uh, later on I discovered my own stuff with the age of let's say 12 13 with Iron Maiden um, Judas Priest stuff like that and then went into the heavier stuff and I mean uh, back when I was like 14 15 there were these bands from our area, um, like bands like Creator or Sodom, that released their first albums or demo tapes and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was natural to to hear that as well. But back then in the eighties, it was like a yeah a different thing. You know, it's you, music wasn't available all the time everywhere and so on. Mm -hmm. So it was more like uh, I grew into this yeah kind of tape trading scene and. Um, I'm not originally from a bigger city. It's more like a, a little village I'm actually from, you know. So it was always like a, a big effort to go into the next record store, into the next city and okay. spend your pocket money on on, on <laughs> albums, you know. Sure. So, um, that's how it was in the 80s, you know. Um, and I think that was, um, um, yeah, I mean, it was difficult to get albums or, or music, but it also... Um, the music back then to me had more value kind of because it was you, you had to put effort in it to get it and then back with the vinyl stuff you know you 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 read every line on the album you watched every little detail on the cover and stuff like that so I think that's what's uh, really like a, a time where I was really like uh, influenced by that metal stuff and that really grabbed me you know and since uh, since then I I never lost touch with the metal uh, metal scene kind of you know mm -hmm. that's really interesting I, I haven't thought about that because yeah growing up it was like cds and vinyl and, and cassettes and having the physical copy and and when you get it you know you go through the liner notes or the booklet and, and really kind of dive into that and that that is is lost i mean for the next generation in, in a way with uh being able to access any song and any album just with the internet um, yeah, kind of, you know, it's like, um, I mean, I work uh, in an orphanage as a, as a social worker, you know, and I have oh, kids wow. in, in that age uh, that I was in when I discovered music, you know, and to them, it's like totally, you know, they, they can't even listen to one song, you know, they always swipe uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> after after 10 seconds and it drives me, drives me crazy sometimes, you know, even, <laughs> if, the, even if the stuff they, they are listening to, it's sometimes better that they swipe it off really quick you know? <laughs> 100%. but it's yeah but it's uh it's like that it's it's uh, a generation that doesn't probably have the values anymore for like physical stuff you know they are so used to to use the the internet you know uh, but on the other hand there are some some kids who um rediscover the vinyl especially and I, I don't know how, how how it is in the states but especially in germany um or yeah, Germany. I think there are a lot of like younger kids that are like probably the weirdos of their generation that uh, collect vinyl again, you mm -hmm. know, and buy 
buy vinyl stuff, um, which is great, you know, and uh, it's a little bit, uh, well, uh, the hope is not lost yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 100%. And I, and I feel like vinyl has made such a big comeback uh, when it comes to that. It just It's a, you know, you have this bigger album and a lot of people that, that are doing albums or, or EPs and stuff, I feel like a lot of artists are releasing not just to Spotify and like the, uh, you know, streaming services, but then it'll be like, and the album. Like, I don't see a whole lot of CDs being sold as much as, as far as it'd be like, here's an album or a limited album and or the vinyl and then you can get the rest of the stuff on the streaming service yeah i think that's a great uh, thing that people can get in touch also back with vinyl again you know so um i i really like that you have this um this code on the vinyl and uh, you can listen to it online or on the streaming services and and have a physical copy which i think is great and it's always like a a, a haptic thing to get the vinyl out of the sleeve and also the smell <laughs> and stuff, you know, that's, yeah. uh, that's totally reminds me in, on my younger days, you know, if I, if I open up a, a, a vinyl uh, sleeve, you know, it's like, like you can smell it kind of, you know, how this it has a certain smell of the good old days kind of. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like the certain smells bring you back. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it's kind of a, a, a recall to the, uh, to the times when you were young and discovered, you know, all the bands and spent your pocket money on on records where you read a great review in a magazine. And then hopefully it's not bad, you know, this kind of surprise when you first uh, put it on the on the player and stuff and uh, the little, you know, the noise it makes. Yeah, the... it's, 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 it's a kind of a cozy feeling that you have with it, you know. A hundred percent. Yeah, and even discovering bands, right? I mean, it was instead of having like here's similar artists or a, you know, it was like I would go and you look at Metal Blade and the bands that they had signed or whatever the the label was of the the artists that you liked at the time, and it was like, oh well, I haven't heard these five bands that hopefully are good. Let's just buy the the record and see what happens. Absolutely. I mean, back then it was. I mean, we were a gang of five people, you know, that became later became my band, you know, my bandmates. Mm -hmm. We always went together to that's that next bigger city, Dortmund, where we everybody had like his uh 20 Deutschmarks back then, you know, like twenty dollars to buy one record or something. Mm -hmm. But he of course bought a different record, you know, and then you went home because you couldn't listen to the album before or maybe in the shop yeah. a bit, you know. But then went home and afterwards calling each other and say, Yeah, this is great. And then if you bought a little, yeah, not so good album, like, oh well, man, I, I think I got the <laughs> the, I got the shitty copy. <laughs> the review was uh, was lying actually about this band, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's yeah, but of course back then also like tape tape trading, mm -hmm. you taped everybody's uh, uh, albums, and then of course that's how the tape trading uh, started too, you know. And that's also because back then when we were young, you know, we uh yeah we just wanted to tape trade too and that was um what is the easiest way to get on tapes you form your own band you know so you have something to trade with you know so mm. uh and that was like the reason why we actually um or why why i formed my first band morgoth in let's say 87 you know and did a the first demo tape and then send it to other bands and you get ta uh, tapes back but it took of course a while you know like three weeks and you were always like opening the letterbox and and Full excitement if there's something from Sweden, from Florida, and stuff like that, you know. And that's how I discovered actually the death metal stuff too, you know. So oh wow, like the, uh, yeah, the very early days, you know, the late yeah. late eighties, I would say, mid to late eighties. Did you start off like I mean, growing up, did you come from a, a musical household? Though it sounded like you said your your parents were playing like Zeppelin and and, and those type of rock bands, but. Uh, is anyone else a musician in your household or were you put in like piano lessons at an early age or guitar lessons, anything like that? No, not at all. <laughs> my father <laughs> was a teacher. My father was a Latin teacher. Okay. My mom, I mean, she, I mean, they liked music, you know, they, they always played music in the car and on our journeys to wherever, you know, and we had, um, yeah, we had a, or my father had a collection of whatever Beatles, uh, Led mm -hmm. Zeppelin stuff, you know, um, and it always like it, I always felt a connection to the stuff with a guitar, you know. Always, if I listened to a guitar a track with a guitar, and back in the seventies when I was a kid, 
like five, six years old, you know, I was, I'm born or was born in 1970. So you, of course, heard the tapes uh, from your parents in the car with all the pretty great stuff, actually, you know, mm -hmm. and it all kicked me it always like I always had the connection to the guitar music, you know, not so much the pop or disco stuff that was a big thing in the 70s, too. It was always like, oh, kiss, you know, and stuff mm. like that, where it had a distorted guitar. So that was a little bit dangerous back then already. And if you looked at to the covers and it was a little mystique around that, you know, and that's always like uh, I always had a connection to that. And that was, um, yeah, also like uh, why I uh, started listening to that stuff or the first record I bought myself was actually when I was 12. I think Iron Maiden Killers. Oh, and wow. That's a great album. And I actually bought that album because only of the cover, you know, because I oh, just the Eddie on the front there. <laughs> so I was like, well, <laughs> this must be great. And it was great. So yeah, was like, right. You got lucky. Yeah, I mean, right. If you're going off yeah, a cover. Yeah. So, so that was the connection uh, with me and, and music. I always had the connection with a distorted guitar that was that hooked me really, you know. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And so you said you started a band early on. I mean, really to kind of do the tape trade and get bands and or hear other bands and get tapes from other people and uh like at what point i mean you've been in a handful of bands obviously throughout your career like um at what point does do you remember kind of the bands getting bigger like like the uh, kind of a milestone of, like success moment and being like wow like this is so amazing that we're i'm able to do you know whatever it may be fill in the blank yeah i think it was um of course when you when you first got your first record contract you know it's like uh we were tape trading, of course, first, and because um, death metal, that kind of music was like, uh, I mean, not really popular in the early mm -hmm. uh, days of, of when it came out, you know, of course, in the underground, you know, everybody was like, uh, yeah, really worshipping the most extreme stuff, you know, but it was only a very limited uh, circle of people, you know, and when we send it out our stuff, you know, with Morgoth, that was in 87, I think. So um, for most of the record companies, we got never heard of them anymore, you know. So it was uh, useless to to send stuff to them, actually. And there was only one record, uh, record label back then, Century Media, um, that, um, that liked the stuff and said, ah, oh, that's great, you know, and, and um, we want to do a record out of this, you know, so or an album. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time when I first hold my own vinyl in my hands, you know, with my music, with me singing on it or with me back then playing bass on it. Uh, that was something special. And it was 89, I think. So from then on, of course, that was a kind of proud moment. Mm -hmm. and from then on, with like touring with bands that you have been connected to with, uh, within the tape trading scene, like, for example, the first uh, tour with... Um, autopsy or with obituary mm -hmm. and then with massacre which was like before massacre was mantas and death and those people who were connected in the in the florida that death metal scene you know you you knew them all from the tape trading kind of thing and then finally you go on tour with these guys you know and that was a kind of like back then still more like a family kind of moment kind of you mm -hmm. know for most of the American bands um, we toured with, that was their first time in Europe as well, like touring, you know, like, and it was like total excitement for them as well. Nowadays, I mean, Obituary and, and all these bigger bands are in the scene yeah. for like 35 years now. And to them, <laughs> right. touring Europe is nothing special anymore. But back, back then it was like really exciting to, to see how people were like reacting and uh, how the Americans said, wow, this is so different from 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 the states why do you put mayonnaise on 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 your on your french fries like in the Caucasian <laughs> thing you know we had that yeah. moment before you know when we oh, were that's doing, so cool uh, with the american bands that came over in the late 80s like i think the first tour we did was with, with autopsy in uh late 89 and then mm -hmm. uh, obituary was 1990 the tour you know and uh, the tour with uh, massacre was 91 and that was kind of a, an excitement too, you know. Also, when the wall came down back then, you know, it was like mm -hmm. the, uh, the Iron Curtain fell, and a lot of people in the Eastern Bloc were so excited to, to and hungry for this kind of music, you know. It was like insane concerts and insane shows we had with those guys, and uh, 
and on those tours you know that was great and that was a pretty strong moment too you know when oh I yeah wow so the first band that you were in, you were the bass player? You didn't sing or you were the singer and bass player? I was singing and playing bass. Okay. I was uh, playing bass in the band called Morgoth and singing in the band called Morgoth until uh, we did, I did two albums where I played the bass too and sang. But then it got too complicated with the songwriting and singing. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, a moment at where I had to had to to um yeah to make up my mind what would i really like to be like more the bass player in the background or <laughs> well the front man you know so uh and it was easier to 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 find a bass player than to, to uh, find a front man i think so and it, yeah. i was more interested in, in in doing that also so i um i quit the bass and uh yeah once in a while i'm 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 still noodling around a little bit here and there <laughs> not really serious <laughs> yeah 100 percent. wow I, I mean just the you've been in a hand, so many so many bands and 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 been able to really do this for so many i mean since the 80 you said 80 87 was when that band started and um i'm curious to like how do you then because as in hell is just like a new new project and and you guys all kind of came together when when did the relationship start with uh the other guys in the band and like how did this band end up forming hmm. um well with my first band morgoth we played a lot of times in 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 denmark okay and in the mid 90s and back then dominus the band from mike from michael paulson back then yeah um, that was supporting before volby was, was exactly. the band. okay so not a lot of people know that he was playing in a death metal band before he formed Volbeat, you know, but uh, yeah, Dominus was a, a band that he had before and we played some shows together in Denmark and we had the same distribution company in Denmark. So that's how we got in touch first, you know, so that lasts back until, yeah, let's say all, also almost uh, 30 years too, you know. Oh my gosh. Um, but then we kind of lost touch um, in the, let's say, early 2000s. And I didn't even know what happened to Dominus back then. And I, I didn't even know that uh, Michael was um, um, forming a new band. And I was a little bit out of that scene, kind of, you know. And, mm -hmm. and uh, um, like uh, in 2008 or 2009, Michael hooked me up or called, wrote me a letter or, or, or an email uh, when I released an album with my band Insidious Disease back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he wrote me, oh, Mark, I heard your album, Insidious Disease, um, um, Shadowcast. That's a fucking brutal album. Great. And uh, I was like, oh, Michael, yeah, I haven't seen or talked to you for like ages. How are you doing? And he was like, yeah, I'm great. I'm doing great. Uh, I have a band called Volbeat. And uh, actually, next month, we're going to play in Berlin. You know, uh, do you want to come around? And we play with uh, Entombed. I said, oh, wow, they're playing with Entombed, you know. So that was 2010, I think. And uh, and then I went to the show, you know, I said, like, man, this I mean, there's a lot of people, man. And two must have grown so huge, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and also these people look a little bit different, you know, more like the rockabilly people. So it was man, what happened to Entombed, you know, and I was <laughs> still expecting to be Entombed headlining, you know. Right, right. And when I entered the uh, arena or the big venue, it was like an 8,000 capacity venue I was like man and tombed are already on what's so volbeat is actually the one that is the headlining man i was like totally shocked you know and i it didn't even know i mean i i kind of lost touch with a uh, with that kind of scene a little bit so i was uh totally confused when i saw man this is insane <laughs> yeah and after the show we had a great chat you know and, and of course i knew the and tube guys too and it was like wow great show and blah and so on and Michael, yeah, we, me and Michael had a good chat back then already about like, yeah, he's he's always has always been into death metal, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, and since then we never lost touch again, and we were always talking. Yeah, one day we're gonna do a death metal project together or something, you know. But oh, I knew wow. I was expecting because Volbeat was so, yeah, busy and getting bigger and bigger and playing. Mm -hmm almost uh, stadium size um, uh, um, arenas and stuff like that. I was uh, thinking, yeah, this is not going to happen. You know that we, yeah, this is just a conversation. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like what? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then, yeah, all of a sudden, like uh, two years ago, he called me up and said, Mark, now is the time to do it. And are you up? And I said, well, yeah, if you are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on. Oh, wow. And so what, how does it start? Does, uh, does Michael have like music that he's going to send you? Like how, how does the project begin? Um, uh, well, I mean, I think it started actually with, um, with Michael writing stuff for the last album, Servant of the Mind, mm -hmm. uh, the last Volbeat album, where he had some riffs already that were too heavy for Volbeat and, he put that aside a bit and, and let it rest for a couple of months or something. And then this uh, special moment had happened where LG Petrov from Entombed tried to call him before he died, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Michael wasn't able to pick up the phone because it was on the register one, one day and the other day was uh, in the middle of the night where LG tried to call him. And then... Uh, the next couple of days he died actually. So he was, Michael was really sad about that, that he couldn't pick up the phone and it was because probably LG wanted to say goodbye or something like that, you know? Yeah, and that was kind nice. of a, a, a thing that made Michael really, uh, yeah, really sad, you know? And uh, yeah, and he was thinking, man, this is something, yeah, really, really uh, tragic that I couldn't pick or speak with him again. And one morning he went on a on a I think on a on a, a a run or something, and all of a sudden he had his iPhone or iPod playing, entombed. I'm full of hell, you know. So uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, so he didn't press a button, and he said he said it's like, this is a call from LG that I have to do this death metal project now. Yeah, you know, it was like, a, and then he picked up the phone and called me and said, dude, you have we have to do it now. And I said, all right, yeah. And um, he had some some stuff written already or put together already from uh, from from that uh, riff that he put aside when he was writing Servant of the Mind for Volbeat. So uh, yeah, that was when pre pretty quick he uh, he sent me some stuff that he recorded together with his friend Morton from Raunchy mm -hmm. uh, in this little garage. Nothing special, you know, just like a little little amp and a little. A drum set and an old guitar you know no fancy fancy uh, recording stuff it was just like recorded with an iphone and uh and i was like all oh, right that's great you know i tried to sing bring some some vocal ideas um onto that and i went to a, a friend of mine who has who's running a studio and just put some ideas on onto it and then we exchanged kind of the files because i mean they live in denmark i live in berlin so uh, we exchanged some files and uh, it was kind of a, this old school feeling uh, that I felt, you know, with like when I recorded like back back then, you know, we re always recorded with a just like a tape tape recorder, you know. Yeah, like a four track really, or something. Really shitty, uh, <laughs> whatever, uh, microphone. It's, and it didn't sound really good, you know, but it was like this this kind of cozy feeling we had, you know, this old school kind of uh uh, tape trading uh, feeling we had when when we exchanged the the files you know and that's how it came together very quickly you know it's like this album was written only in like let's say six eight to eight months i would say wow and was it all done kind of remotely like that or did you guys eventually once the the you know it was like sending back and forth and it was like oh this is this is a really cool thing let's let's uh, get together and write the album or was it all done kind of that sh file sharing way? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty much only doing uh, the file sharing uh, stuff because I mean, they send it or they actually him and Morton, the drummer, they always had like, it's called death metal Friday. <laughs> <laughs> they always met Fridays when they're, I mean, they have both kids in the same age, you know, six years. And they were playing together. They are good friends, actually, the kids, you know. Oh, and, that's cool. Yeah. And both of the daddies went into the garage while the kids and the and moms were uh, playing with the kids on the porch or in the garden. And they were went into Moller's uh, man cave and uh, <laughs> recorded some death metal stuff, you know. So, uh, and yeah, it was basically, it was only like the, uh, the, the yeah, exchanging files and stuff. And I was doing that stuff um, or sending ideas over where I would sing this and that. And Michael had some ideas too, where he just like sang in in his iPods and or iPhone and, and uh -huh. uh, sent it to me, like very simple, like very 
rudimentary, you know, like um, very, uh, yeah, you could almost say unprofessional kind of, you know. Or, yeah. Yeah, not, nothing really fancy, very yeah, from the heart kind of, or from the stomach, you know. Mm -hmm. If you had an idea, it was like, yeah, you, you try this on that riff, and like, you know, very uh, <laughs> simple. But it reminded me back uh, on those days where I started actually being in a band, and that was kind of a cool feeling, you know brought back some mem memories where I tried to record stuff with my tape recorder and had to stay exactly on that place, on that shelf to press a uh, um, uh, record. Yeah, record. Everything <laughs> perfect or kind of perfect uh, on the tape, you know, on the, on the, on the cassette actually. So mm -hmm. it was kind of uh, yeah, fun and very simple to do, but uh, actually we the first time we really met was when we met in the studio actually to record. Oh, really? Stuff. Yeah, yeah. We never oh, rehearsed wow. before. <laughs> so it was just going back and forth, getting the songs together, and then everyone meeting in the studio to put it down on the on the album. Yeah, and also the, stu the in the studio, it was really quick. You know, we we didn't. I mean, they rehearsed very often and very. They were really tight with the songs. You know, already when they entered the studio, so and it was almost played live. You know, in the mm -hmm. in a live atmosphere. So we only had like actually one week for for the recordings and wow. let's say, yeah let's say 10 days you know one week for the for the um, instruments and three or four days for my vocal stuff so there was not a, a long studio time you know it was more like back in the old school days as well where you didn't have the money to uh, or you couldn't afford an expensive studio or to stay in a studio for such a long time you know mm -hmm. it's a death metal band you know so it was, yeah, really quick and really, yeah, uh, just a punch in the face. One first take sometimes, you know, and then that's it. <laughs> wow, that's cool. That's really cool. I I love hearing just you talk about like those old recording processes and, and, you know, even recording on the iPhone or on the old tape. Like, I think there's something cool. Like, there's some, like, grid and, like, you can really hear really the authenticity of the of the whole thing when you when you when you do it that way, I feel like. Yeah, I think that's really important, you know, to have um, to have it authentic, you know, not to not to overproduce, you know. I think mm -hmm. I, I mean I really like the sound that uh, Jacob Hansen did. Mm -hmm. on the no, album. the album is awesome. It doesn't it's have that sound, super but... super polished sound to it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great sound, but it's not so you know, it just happened, you know, because whatever we didn't put so much effort into everything, you know. It was more like even if there was a little little mistake, you know. Back in the day, or in the in the late late eighties or mid two thousands, you would have said, "Nah, it's not the perfect note. Mm. It has to be perfect." And we said, "Ah, fuck that!" You know, it's like, <laughs> like this, you know, even if, if there's a little mistake, it's it makes it breathe. It makes it authentic, as you said. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Um, and you also have like two other bands that you're doing at the same time. Like that's got got to be a lot going on, right? Uh, well, I mean, my main band is Insidious Disease that I yeah. have with um, uh, Silenos from uh, Dimu Borgia and Shane from Napalm Death and a couple of other guys, you know, so uh, that's my main band, band nowadays, but I also have like two other bands called This Creation and uh, yeah. Demos Dawn and another project um, that is called uh, Leper, um, Leper Colony. Oh um, wow! They, I was only aware of yeah, insidious disease <laughs> and <laughs> this yeah, creation. Actually, that's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pretty busy. You know, it's like uh, and of course it's uh, the 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 COVID years pay ah, uh, sure pay tribute to that too. You know, it's because like people ever ask me, oh, shall we do the an album together? And it was like, yeah, you you never. I mean, you, know, you never know when you're gonna be back on stage again. So I was like having time to do studio stuff too. So uh, that's when all the <laughs> the the other bands uh, flourish kind of and um, mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately or not fortunately um, they got all released in the same year now so I have together with S and Hell I've put out like four records this year so this is kind of like well it's a little bit because every record label wanted to release it now you know because yeah COVID is over and and they wanted to get it out so yeah it's uh, it's kind of strange that uh, the year two thousand 23 is uh, the year where I put out four records. I, I guess this is never <laughs> going to ha going to happen again, I think. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Are you doing? I mean, even with with As in Hell, are you guys doing like a tour to support the album or like playing any shows? I didn't see a whole lot of like touring scheduled, or was I miss missing something here? Uh um, we're not gonna tour. We're not gonna like do like a six week tour in the states, six week in uh, yeah in Europe because it's we have our usual job. We have our day jobs, you know. Uh, at least uh, the drummer and me. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, we gonna play only festivals next year. So next year festival season, uh, we're gonna play a lot of shows. Um, yeah, on the summer festivals, especially here in Europe, we have a lot of great festivals here so uh, i don't know about the the states there are some some festivals uh, in the states or some maybe maybe a little tour on the east coast maybe a little show in the west coast or something if that's going to happen or support mm-hmm. other bands um for a shorter pre- period of time but it's uh not possible to do like a, a full tour with like uh especially in the, in the states if you or north america if you do a full circuit is like uh yeah six to eight weeks usually oh yeah it's a big big there's a lot of space to cover right i mean like exactly yeah. whereas yeah, yeah. in europe you can hit a bunch of different countries pretty fairly quickly yeah and we both have you know we all have kids you know we all have regular jobs i mean death metal doesn't pay my bills you know <laughs> so I, I have to work um as a social worker so uh yeah uh, and i'm uh, spending my my holidays for 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 shows you know for yeah. for touring you know so and it's only a limited uh, amount of uh, holidays i can take so yeah but it will uh, there will be live shows for sure and uh, festival appearances that's exciting well thank you mark for doing this I, I it's been a great uh time hanging out with you i really appreciate it and thanks for being so flexible on the reschedule and everything thank you for having me and uh, yeah sorry again for <laughs> oh no no that- need to apologize I have one more question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, well, I mean, nowadays it's. I think it's even more hard to to get recognized, you know. So, of course, if you're a young band, and I'm speaking as a 53 year old old man, um, and if you have the time and if you have the effort, just play live as much as you can, and just like it's 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 a lot of work, but. Um, if you believe in the dream, um, just follow that, you know, follow your dream. And um, yeah, but on the other hand, I would say also have in mind, you know, a musical career isn't, um, you can't take it for granted, you know, so for kids, you know, also you you should expect not to make it, you know, uh, that's also like a, a thing that I uh, have to say, you know, it's like, Follow your dreams, but also keep in mind, have a second op- opportunity to to do, you know, after uh, maybe your band is not going to break it or not going to make any money for you, you know. <laughs>